Good afternoon, First Baptist Church. It is so good to see you here today and to have you join me for this midweek Bible study as we continue our venture through the book of Ecclesiastes. As we've been going through Ecclesiastes these past eight weeks, we've noted that uh, it is a book of wisdom and that even though at times it sounds a bit depressing, it really does give us insight as to how to have a proper perspective or attitude towards life. We talked, for instance, about how chapter 4 it gives insights about our relationships and the importance of relationships. When we explored chapter 5 and 6, we talked about how our participation in life, uh, usually in the Hebrew Bible, is expressed through what we say and what we contribute through our speech and our mouth, ought to come under the Lordship of Christ. And we also talked about Ecclesiastes 7 this past week about how it gives us insight as to how we are to carry our attitude towards other. It really does give us an attitude adjustment. Today we're going to talk about Ecclesiastes 8 and 9. We'll read portions in chapter 8 and portions in chapter 9, which talks about our public service or our works or our, or, or our participation in both the public sphere and in work and the implications of how to balance family and work. So with that, before we uh, jump in, let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray for today's lesson. Lord, we thank you that we can study your word. We ask that as we gain insight, it will be formative for us, that the Holy Spirit might shape us, inspire us, transform us, that we might be drawn closer and nearer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, church, let's jump in. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Our first portion of scripture that we're reading is chapter 8, verses 2 through 15. And this talks about our pub participation in the public sphere, how we're to act within the government and within community. And from there, it's going to go into our participation in work, and then also how to balance that with family. So let's read Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 2 through 15. We'll stop along the way to see what it might teach us today. Chapter 8, verse 2. Keep the king's command because of your sacred oath. Do not be terrified. Go from his presence. Do not delay when the matter is unpleasant, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is powerful, and who can say to him, What are you doing? Whoever obeys a command will meet no harm, and the wise mind will know the time and way. This is a good reminder that we are to be upright citizens in the communities in which we live. Remember that as Christians we bear no allegiance to any one nation. We are not marked by boundaries or ethnicity or race as Christ followers. But as we are baptized and died to Christ, so we live with him, calling Christ Lord. And because we call him Lord, our only allegiance is to the kingdom of God. And yet, over these past 2,000 years and even before then, Christians have done a marvelous work by being a part of their communities in which they've lived whether it be under the tyranny of a despot in a communist country or in the many ways we live as a free nation here in America. Christians have found a way to live as kingdom citizens in order so that we obey God, but part of obeying God is to obey our laws. It doesn't mean we ought not to protest laws or to go against laws in a nonviolent uh, uh, way uh, and, for laws that go against God's word. But we are to do so as we work every day in our quiet resolve to be witnesses for Christ. That means fulfilling everything from jury duty to voting, to writing our senators and our representatives, to remembering that as upheaval occurs in every nation, we are not to join in the upheaval or the drama, but rather to bear witness to the Lordship of Christ that others may turn and see that no matter what catastrophes are going on, no matter what conflict or wars or upheaval is happening in our nation today, that we can all look to Jesus, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But that kingship and that lordship also calls us to action, to press against not flesh and blood, but powers and principalities, as Paul wrote, so that we might further the cause of the kingdom, bringing about justice, righting wrongs, 
and bringing restoration and joining God in repairing the world. Not that we might go against the laws and break laws, but that we might work in concert as upright citizens, what the New Testament calls good Christians, good faithful followers, whom others can count on, that we might bear witness to Christ and to demonstrate our love for one another. Oftentimes I hear a lot of Christians say, well, I have a right to do this, I have a right to do that. I'm sorry. But when you give your life to Christ, the only rights you have are those that the Lord allows you to have, which means that you bypass your rights as an individual so that you might give your, so that you might give your life to the Lord. And that whatever individual initiative you think you might take in order to better yourself over and against others, you are to serve others. Jesus is very clear on our role as servant leaders who participate in the community around us, not to be of the world, but to be in the world for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's what Ecclesiastes is saying. It's saying that leaders will do whatever they want, governments will do whatever they want, and often we have very little way of, of shifting secular governments. But we are to participate, giving the kind word and the quiet confidence of Jesus Christ and his lordship. And yet, knowing when to pray, when to participate, when to go to a higher authority of God, and when to participate in a way that's healthy. And so, what we do is we remind people of Christ's Lordship. And the next verse, in 6, it also affirms that. Let's read 6, uh, and then keep from there. For every matter has its time and its way, although the troubles of men lie heavy upon them. This is another way of saying that we know that God is drawing us closer to his future. That there is a season for everything, just as Ecclesiastes admonishes. And yet, even in the midst of those seasons, we face hardship, turmoil, tragedy. And yet we know that even death does not have the final say. That though things hit us, that there are seasons of good and of plenty and of bad and of scarcity that God provides for us. And because of that, we do not get ourselves mixed up in the mud of everyday life, but rather rise above the short-sightedness of mankind to have a heavenly vision and a greater perspective of knowing that God's timing is perfect and that we are continuing to follow Christ into that future where we will eventually greet Jesus in his second coming. All right, let's keep reading in verse 7. Indeed, they do not know what it is to be, for who can tell them how it will be? He's talking about kings here and leaders. No one has power over the wind to restrain the wind, or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from the battle, nor does wickedness deliver those who practice it. All this I observed, applying my mind to all that is done under the sun, while one person exercises authority over another, to the others hurt. Again, he's basically saying that the reason why we as Christ followers have perspective, the reason why we look from a heavenly perspective is we know that even a king's authority is limited. That even the most powerful in our community has limits. And that no matter how powerful a person is, they can't control the wind. There are things beyond their control. And because there are things beyond our control, we fully rely and trust and pledge our allegiance to Christ who is the master of the sea, and, e and who gives the command that even the winds obey him. You remember that story in Mark 4 when there's a storm, the disciples are on a boat with Jesus, and they're fretting, and they are facing crisis. They go to wake Jesus up, and Jesus calms the storm, and they say, who is this that even the wind obeys him? We have to remember that often we find ourselves in the midst of the storm. And like, as if we're running around like chickens without our heads, we go to Jesus and Jesus says, Fear not. Peace be with you. And he calms our storms. It's we who react to the storm in an overblown, exaggerated fashion, all while forgetting to put our faith and trust in he who is the master over the storm. All right, we're going to read uh, 10 through uh, 15 and then... Uh, move to the next section. This goes from 
from the authority and, and seeing authority to that sphere of work where we may have authority and practice authority where we work and engage in, in uh, the public sphere. Verse 10, Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. Because sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, and the human heart is fully set to do evil. Those sinners do evil a hundred times and prolong their lives, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God, because they stand in fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will they prolong their days like a shadow, because they do not stand in the fear before God. There is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people who are treated according to the conduct of the wicked, and there are wicked people who are treated according to the conduct of the righteous. I said this, that this is also vanity. That's through verse 14. See, we see here that as we participate in life, as we work, as we do our best to be good citizens, as we obey the laws and at the same time work hard in order to, in order to uh, please our bosses and do the right thing, that we have to come to terms that sometimes, just because we do the right thing, we may not necessarily escape hardship or tragedy. And that though we may see wickedness around us, even they who do not stand in fear of God may get ahead or may be placed in a, a, a position of privilege. But that is not con our concern. Because our concern is to continue to push with quiet resolve and with active participation and with conviction, the Lordship of Christ in every sphere of our life, no matter where we find ourselves, whether in triumph or tragedy. For death is the great equalizer in which one day we will all stand before that judgment seat before Christ. But may we not stand before that judgment seat without helping our friends and our fellow man and women to experience and to know and to at least have the opportunity to respond to the Lordship of Christ in their life. Let's go ahead and read verse 15, and then we're going to shift here from the government and authority and power to work to balancing that with family. Verse 15. So I commend enjoyment, for there is nothing better for people under the sun than to eat and drink and enjoy themselves, for this will go with them in their toil through the days of life that God gives them under the sun. We already saw that Ecclesiastes addresses modesty and balance. That if we drink too much, eat too much, if we do things in excess, we do it to our harm. And we do it to our detriment. So he already talked about doing things in modesty. And now he's, with that understanding and that perspective from previous chapters, coming back to say, look, things are going to happen around us. There's a matter for everything, and there's a season for everything. And we know better because we have a heavenly perspective. And so let us enjoy life. Let us not get wrapped up in the drama of all of the nonsense and the, the upheaval we see around us. Let us be helpful and bring about justice where we are able. Let us push back against those things that cause harm or hurt or evil. But at the same time, we have to do it with a joyful spirit, with kindness and happiness, because we follow Christ, the author of life and of death. Because of that, our hope resides not in the systems and institutions of this world. And our hope resides and lives entirely in the faith and in our trust in Christ. And because of that, he shifts to balancing work and participation in the public sphere with family and with making sure that we have a balance. So what we're going to do is we're going to shift to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, but we're only going to read in chapter 9, verses 7 through 12, as we continue this lesson. Verse 7 through 12 in chapter 9. Go, eat your bread with enjoyment, and drink your wine with a merry or happy heart. For God has long ago approved what you do. Let your garments always be white. Do not let oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love, all the days of your vain life that are given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life, and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in the grave or Sheol to which you are going. 
Again I say that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to the skillful, but time and chance happen to all of them. For no one can anticipate the time of disaster, like fish taken in a cruel net, and like birds caught in a snare, so men and women and mortals are snared in the time of calamity when it suddenly falls upon them. This is probably one of my favorite verses in all of scripture. That the battle that uh, the battle and the race is not to the swift, nor battle to the strong, but time and chance happens to all of us. And what I love about this text is it's saying don't be lazy and passive, don't life let, uh, pass you by. The book of Ecclesiastes already encouraged us to take responsibility where we can, to make changes and to make improvements and to love our neighbors and love God in ways that are healthy and in which we participate in life, not disobeying the law, but rather supporting our neighbors in order to better our communities, to be a healthy and faithful and reliable part of our community by as we bear that quiet witness of Christ. But here it turns to that balance of family, of being content with the things that we have, of enjoying the things and the blessings that God has given us, whether it be our relationships here in, in this portion, our wife, or our families, or our friends, to the point that the portion of bread, that daily bread that God gives us, should be sufficient for us. That we might not go about life exploiting others, or trying to get ahead at the expense of others, or not taking responsibility to bring about justice, and to make things right, and to join God in repairing the world. In this idea of enjoyment, he already said don't go overboard. But he affirms that we need to open our eyes to the good things and the blessings and the gifts we have. And to be grateful. And to put that to work for our behalf and for the behalf of others in the glory of God. I remember when I was dating Christina, I was wondering if she was the one. And I was praying through that and I was so afraid of disobeying the Lord and worry I was worrying about well what happens if Christina's not the one and, and I don't want to disobey God and not do God's will and in wondering if I should marry Christina what happens if God has other plans for me and I was so anxious I reached out to one of my best friends who said to me actually based on on these scriptures Joe the person that God has put in your life is there for a reason a gift and all you have to do is choose to love that person that means that when you choose to love that person, you're doing it in the full freedom of enjoying the gift that God has given you. Not because God has predetermined every step of your way, but because when you choose to receive and to love and to accept that gift, it becomes all the more valuable. Because in choosing that gift, you choose not to accept or receive other gifts, or to look elsewhere as if the grass is greener on the other side. I remember after that I was still anxious about it and I wondered about Christina and I went to my father and my dad said uh, Joe this is a good one she's a keeper you better marry her and I remember him talking to me on the couch and in that moment making this decision and choosing to marry Christina and what beautiful thing it is when God gifts us with something or things or people and we make a choice to live into that gift, to receive it, to love it, and to be committed to it, whether it's our marriage, or family, our relationships. So many people complain about their jobs. I always tell people, if you don't like your job and you complain, look for others. And I know it's not that easy. Sometimes we work, we're 28 years into a 30-year job, or we're five years away from our pension, and we're kind of stuck where we are. Even then, have an attitude adjustment, as Ecclesiastes 7 already had, and, and be grateful for what you have. Go into that job asking God to give you the insight to see opportunities rather than the complaints and challenges. Ecclesiastes already addressed complaining. It already addressed our attitude. So when we put this entire book together and kind of live into this chapter, 
We are reminded to be content in all things. It doesn't mean we can't aspire to be better. In fact, we ought to aspire to be better. Perhaps to, to go for a different job that might put us in a place of greater leadership or give us more opportunities. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that if you're in a circumstance in which you're doing all that you can, even today, see it as a gift. If you have cancer or an ailment, see the people whom you meet along that journey of hardship as gifts, where you have opportunities to touch the lives of others, to bless others, even when your life is haunted and broken, crippled under those ailments or those various uh, circumstances that you can't help. For God helps us in the midst of our gratitude, and God helps us when we give praise to Him, even when we're at our hardest moments. You may not always feel it. And the Bible doesn't naively tell you you should be happy in everything. There are plenty of parts in Scripture in which we can pray to God with all of our anger and all of our frustration and all of our hurt. But even then, as we hand God our anger and we hand over our frustrations and our complaints, and we even complain to God, that is us letting it go and giving it to God, that it might not burden us and weigh us down and make us unhealthy and inflict us with dis-ease that doesn't allow us to be who God fully calls us to be, no matter the circumstance. On this beautiful day, I know things are not easy, and I know there is, there is plenty of uncertainty on the horizon, but live into this day as a gift of God. Fear the Lord. Open your eyes to the gifts around you. Stop taking people for granted. Stop taking your things for granted. Stop taking advantage of others. But see them as gifts given to you for the glory of God that you might declare your allegiance today again to the Lordship of Christ and to do the best you can and all you can for God's glory. Amen. Have a wonderful day.